Um, it's our first endodontic lecture at the study club. So thank you so much, Lynn, for presenting tonight. Um, Dr. BC completed a one-year hospital dental residency at San Diego Naval Medical Center. And as a naval officer, she practiced general dentistry around the world on a Navy warship. Dr. Baldessari Cruz <laughs> completed postgraduate training in endodontics at the University of Iowa College of Dentistry in 1998 and became a diplomat of the American Board of Endodontics in 2001. Dr. BC is a member of many professional dental organizations, CDA, ADA, AAE, ABE, I'm not sure what those are, <laughs> and COD, um, um, M MPDS, SMCDS, uh, so that's in mid, mid Peninsula and uh, C CSAE, and the Northern California Academy of Endodontics. Dr. BC has published research articles in the Journal of Endodontics. Dr. BC loves working with patients, helping them improve their dental health. Her encouraging motto is, preserving your natural smile. Please welcome Dr. Baldessari Cruz. Well, I'm really happy to be here. Let me just say that much. And thank you for inviting me to talk. I know I talked to Jim and he said, come on down. And I'm really happy to be here to talk with you guys about endodontics. It's been, um, like you said, a long time since you have not had an endodontist speak, right? And you're probably hoping to hear about root canals, which I'm not talking about those. <laughs> no, um, I'm talking about um, some topics that are very, very challenging. And uh, let me just get things uh, listed here. We're going to start with the hot topics here. Okay, <clears throat> excuse me. All of the topics that I'm talking about tonight are under an umbrella of actually getting great diagnostics done and uh, using CT scan, CBCT, okay? All of these are uh, cases that are potentially going to be lost. And, you know, Rich is happy about that because it's going to come to his office now. <laughs> and Bruce. <laughs> no, but what we're trying to do for the patient is um, save their tooth. They want to save their tooth. So um, there's a lot of uh, areas in um, the first one is longitudinal fractures uh, that are lost teeth. And we're finding way more about them because of CT scans, okay? Uh, regeneration, uh, it, it's not regeneration like the periodontist over here that has been doing regeneration for decades. This is pulpal regeneration, okay? Endodontic regeneration. And that's due to traumatic injuries, right? You know, that's what it is. Um, and then resorption. There are a lot of resorptive cases that are really uh, challenging, and many of those, um, the tooth is lost, okay? So we're going to go into that kind of detail about this tonight. And um, <clears throat> I have kind of an aggressive, or I should say an ambitious schedule, talking about three different things. But we're actually going to start with longitudinal fractures. And longitudinal fractures... Um, uh, require uh, a good assessment, and a lot of times in our practices, uh, the hygienist is looking at the teeth maybe a, a lot more than we are, each and every tooth. Um, but when we go in and do our assessment after the hygienist maybe looks at the teeth, we've got to look for signs of these cracks in the teeth, okay? So um, <clears throat> we would like to know, if we can, what is the extent of the fracture? We'd like to know when just a restoration is needed, when a root canal is needed, when an extraction is needed. And it's sometimes very challenging to know these things. So we have to look at um, the different factors that make these things up. So we're going to look at the different types of fractures, uh, the identification and detection of them, how the cone beam CT scan fits into that, uh, how we manage it, what's the prognosis, and, uh, and then long-term follow-up. So there's general characteristics for these longitudinal fractures. They represent vertical extensions of fractures over distance and time. These things are moving. It's not just the crack appeared and there's a crack there. I mean, they are linear fractures that grow and change. And when you see one, it's not going to be the same the next time you see it, OK? They're moving. So the, the patient gets some kind of injury that causes a crack in their teeth, and then their behavior continues this thing on. And if they don't get education from us so they can change their behavior, or if we don't catch it and put a crown on it or do something to help it, it's going to grow and they're going to lose this tooth. 
So um, <clears throat> it's very challenging diagnostics, treatment, prognosis. And what's confusing is that every crack that's in a tooth is in the literature and it's called vertical fractures. And there's many that are different. And so we have to know the differences between them, okay? So we know what to do with them. These are the five types of uh, longitudinal fractures. Craze lines, fractured cusp, cracked tooth, split tooth, vertical root fracture. There's a global definition so that the entire world can look at these fractures and know what their definition is. They uh, are gathering um, information on these so they can put together the best uh, prognosis and treatment modalities for these fractures. And we're trying to um, uh, get rid of really misunderstandings and inappropriate treatment for these fractures. So we're trying to get on board throughout the world to, to treat these. Well, when we start off trying to identify these or detect the cracks, certainly the patient's symptoms is a big deal. We, you know, they come in because they're having pain. But again, the visual exam is going to be important. So again, hygienists and just dental exams when they come in um, every six months or whatever, take a good look, take pictures, document things down because even if they don't want a crown and they, they see it, the patient feels like you're just trying to sell them a crown, um, there's really uh, a problem with these cracks and they're, it's getting worse. I don't know about uh, the oral surgeons here, but over the past couple of two, three years, I've had lots of people clenching, grinding, cracking their teeth. There's a lot of people getting more uh, night guards, but um, a lot of extractions due to cracked teeth. In fact, the literature shows about um, 30% of uh, teeth that have had root canals end up getting extracted. So that's a lot. But um, <clears throat> dental history, a lot of people have a history of cracked teeth. So you have to ask them about it. You have to talk to them about their habits because there's um, some big habits that have to be changed. So I spent a lot of time talking to people. And uh, over the past couple of years, I've had a lot of people that were sent for root canals. And um, they don't need a root canal. They just need somebody to talk to and learn how to not clench and get relaxation. I mean, I've had a lot of people that I just turn away that don't need root canals. So um, if we can talk to them about their habits and get, uh, of course, information, subjective, objective. But uh, then we get to our images that are needed. 100% of the time when I get a referral for an endodontic uh, assessment, I need a periapical image. So I'll, I'll get, you know, um, whatever, panos from two years ago. I'll get a bite wing, but I need a PA. And it needs to be current. You know, it's, it's very helpful to know what's happening right now. So um, we'll take angled images to get a better look at maybe a crack. Uh, but certainly the cone beam CT T scan is the most important right now. But we have to remove the restoration. We have to stain it. I don't know if anybody's using methylene blue dye. It's got a really thin film thickness. And it's very helpful to just put a drop in there and it'll identify the crack a little bit more. You can take photos of it. It's helpful to talk to the patient about it. You know, they can see what's going on with their tooth. Transillumination is important uh, because we can light it up and I'll show you that. Wedging sometimes and surgical assessment. So one thing that is also confusing about terminology is this cracked tooth syndrome. Um, when people have a cracked tooth, which is actually out of these five fractures, the worst one, um, well, I shouldn't say the worst one, but the most sometimes difficult, challenging one. Um, they Sometimes the patient will have acute pain uh, on mastication, biting or release. Uh, they might have cold water pain or sharp pain to cold. But there's a wide variety of symptoms because if this crack goes into the pulp, you're going to have irreversible pulpitis. You're going to have pulp necrosis. You could have apical periodontitis. Do you know what that is, apical periodontitis? Anybody? I'll talk about it in just a second. OK, so acute apical abscess, when you have a big swelling, when there's a sinus tract draining, all these things can happen uh, when the uh, pulp is exposed due to a crack. And so this isn't really a syndrome. And just for terminology's sake, a syndrome is a group of symptoms that consistently occur together, which there's such a wide variety with a cracked tooth. It, it definitely is not in the syndrome category. Apical periodontitis, this is when the pulp has been necrotic for so long that it destroys the periradicular tissues. 
So we want to catch a necrotic pulp before it wrecks the PDL, before it wrecks all the bone. And how do you test that? Well, if you're going to do a big restoration, if you're going to do a crown, if you're going to do a bridge, whatever big thing you're going to do to that tooth, um, get a PA. Because I have had patients come into my practice that just got veneers, and like two of them have big lesions on the apices. It's really hard for me. I don't tell, a, I, you know, I do tell a lie. I was going to say I don't tell a lie. No, I just say, they're all like, how come my dentist didn't see that? And I'm all like, oh, these things, you know, whatever. I just make up something. You know, I never make you look bad. <laughs> but, um, you know, it, it's really important to do these things ahead of time uh, and get the PA and look at it. The other thing you can do is put a piece of ice on it. You know, um, see if it's responsive because before you see that lesion, uh, it could be necrotic, and that's when we want to catch it. So if it's totally calcified, if you get a, a con, um, you know previous trauma from ages ago and the tooth looks totally calcified, well, it might not respond well to ice, but um, or send it for just a, a quick consult or something. But you don't want to get into trouble um, and have these things, uh, you know, be embarrassing, right? Um, a sinus tract, okay, uh, I get all these uh, comments that the patient has a fistula, and a sinus tract is what drains from a tooth out of your mouth, okay? A fistula is between two body cavities, like the oral antral fistula. So it's just a terminology, if we get that straight, it's going to be less confusing, okay? Quick question, man. Yes. What's the standard of chin artists after root canal therapy to see if the lesion has healed? Because I guess too many mm. patients I take a panel, yeah. Yeah. they still all have a lesion at the apex. Mm -hmm. Good, that's a great question. I'm just thinking of the same exact question. <laughs> Well, like I said, hopefully we catch them before they have a huge lesion because it varies on the size of the lesion, the uh, immune status of the patient. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of things. So it's, it's very difficult, and it's good to get a baseline and to follow that. But if we have uh, a lesion uh, at the apice that's like two to three millimeters, you know, um, it might take six to eight months to heal. If you have something much bigger than that, and I'm going to show you one that's ginormous, um, it's going to take years to heal. Mm -hmm. So when people come into my office, um, I tell them, hey, this is going to take like a year or two to heal, but you're going to come back in six months, eight months, in a year. I'm going to look at it, and we're going to measure how it's healing. Mm -hmm. So um, we, we follow those until they're gone because I, I want it to work, you know. Right. But, I mean, they could have leakage. They could have a new trauma to it. They could, like, not have gotten their crown. I have had some that the crown is put on and the cotton pellet's still in there. So, um, you know, there's things that can happen that make it linger along. But I'd say that um, depending on the size of the lesion and if they get it restored properly, it should heal uh, no sooner probably than four to six months if it's small. But usually it's, you know, could be up to a year. In fact, we go up to four years on some of these uh, lesions. So it takes a while. If you had one there that was an old scar and it didn't change, okay, it was asymptomatic. Well, sometimes there's scar Could tissue. Could it take forever? I mean, maybe... No, sometimes scar, it, scar tissue, if you follow it and it hasn't changed, then it, um, you know, it's not going to if it's yeah, scar tissue. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Just yeah. Right, right, so yeah. That's, yeah, that's the key is you follow it. Well, well, the key is tracing the PDL. Which is something when we get to resorption I'm going to talk about too because you, you have to, uh, you really have to do a lot of diagnostics and, and monitor things before you just make, you know, take action sometimes. Um, so just when you get to the subjective and objective info, we're trying to pinpoint the area. Sometimes the whole side hurts and we're just trying to you know, narrow it down. Uh, again, habits and recent changes, if they've had uh, new fillings, crowns, whatever's done, what's the stresses in their life? Because again, sometimes they're clenching and grinding and maybe that's all they need is someone to listen to them and help them uh, get through that. Um, they could have tender muscles of mastication, wear facets, marginal ridge cracks. So you wanna look for those and note them all down. Magnification is huge to look at these things. Whether you have loops, I have a microscope, which is helpful, the transilluminator. If you scratch the class five area, buccal and lingual, um, that's really helpful. 
what happened there? Okay, boop, okay. I'm not gonna move. Okay, I scratched it, okay. Uh, when you're using a probe to assess, um, get a good probe. It can't be a huge one that you can't see the notches on. Get a skinny probe that you can read and you're gonna go all the way around the tooth like 12 times on each side to look for a narrow pocket. You have to go slow and you know, I mean, it's like, you know, finding a, a hiding animal, right? You wanna go really slow. <laughs> um, certainly start with uh, ruling out adjacent teeth. So I look at it and I see signs that it's maybe these two teeth, so I rule out all the other teeth with these percussion palpation tests and we're trying to reproduce the pain so we can get on with it. Uh, cracks rarely show up in images, but what I wanna tell you tonight is that abnormal changes are right next to the crack. So we've gotta look for a smaller chamber size, a condensing osteitis, widened PDL, or the J-shaped classic lesion that you get in the bone for a vertical root fracture. Those things you wanna look at, and the CT scan is helping us see more of this stuff, okay? So let's get to the CT. Um, <clears throat> first, we wanna understand it better. And uh, many of you have CTs in your office. You have one, you have one. Who else has one? I have one, no, <laughs> anybody else? Okay, does anybody send out um, cases to get a CT scan? Okay, good. So some of these are difficult to uh, certainly analyze. I send oftentimes um, a case to the oral radiologist because I want them to give me information back that confirms what I found, find something that I didn't find, and I like that piece of paper uh, to give to the patient that shows them exactly what the specialists think. And they have that to hang on to. Sometimes it says vertical root fracture, or they, you know, sometimes it says something they don't wanna hear, but they have evidence, so to speak, from a specialist that does this all the time. So, um, but anyway, there's three types of CT scans, CBCT scans. Um, the field of view is either large, medium, or small, okay? And each one of these have different acquisition parameters and they render the image differently, the quality differently. And, it's, and you get different ones for various diagnostic purposes. So a large and medium field of view, their volumes equal or greater than eight by eight centimeters. And they're acquired when you want a quantity of information. You want to look at the oral maxillofacial complex, airways, TMJ, cervical spine, that you want, you're looking at a lot of stuff. And um, <clears throat> these are constructed or reconstructed, I should say, in voxels. And voxels are tri-dimensional pixels that help uh, look at the spatial uh, resolution. So your, your digital camera is, takes a picture and it's used pixels to put the spatial resolution together. This is 3D, so it's a tri-dimensional pixel. So when you have smaller voxels, you can see better detail. The smaller field of view is equal or less than six by six centimeters. And you get this type of uh, CT scan when you want to see the quality. That's more important than the amount of information you're getting. Second, um, there's parameters to go with each one of these. And uh, the best parameters can help us maximize the chances of seeing those kind of changes in the microstructures, seeing a vertical root fracture or the uh, anatomy changes that happen. So a uh, higher MA above eight, lets you see better visualization. Higher KB, KVP values over 90, you can decrease the artifacts, because there's a lot of artifacts that are hard to, you know, like focus on what you're trying to see. And it improves the overall quality of the image. Acquisition time, a longer acquisition times, you get a better resolution. And there's a thing called beam hardening, you see down at the bottom there. Um, that is when there's a lot of streaking in the uh, image. And it's really uh, difficult to sometimes dissect out what you're looking at. And metal posts and gutta percha have a lot of beam hardening. So the parameters have to change for endo if we're gonna try to see these fractures. So there's a thing called endodontic enhanced advanced imaging. That's a mouthful. But it requires small field of view, small voxel size, higher KVP, and MA, and longer exposure times. And of course, when it's clinically possible, some patients maybe can't 
tolerate something like this, but we're going to get more answers to what they're trying to find out if we have the right parameters and we'll be able to see what we need to see. So when a patient comes to my office for an endo um, consult and they're bringing a CT scan from another provider that's a non-endo provider, most of the time it's, it's actually not adequate. You know, I mean, I look at it and, you know, I might have to take a new one because it's not showing me. It's just too big. It's like for um, an implant or, you know what I mean? The, the, it was taken and it's just the wrong size. So um, it also, if they bring it from another office, I can't, like, take pictures of it. You know, so if I, take it, if I take it myself, I can make pictures, I can show some things to the patient, I can manipulate it better, and again, get the correct parameters for helping me. So this is just um, an idea. Uh, this is where a pointer will help, so I'm just going to point with my finger. But you can see that little dot by the molar on the sort of distal lingual side. That's a radiolucency that's alongside a fracture. Okay, so this is the kind of thing that you can see. Uh, when you're looking at these CT scans. That corresponds with this radiolucency going down the root here. And then we can look at it in, you have to have two or three views that show you the same thing to know that it's really there, okay? So the last picture on the upper right, you can see the crack going down the tooth. And then this um, sort of topical rendering, you can see the crack and then you can see it coming down a little bit further past the C, CEJ there. But these are the kind of things that if you get the right parameters, you can see more stuff. A lot of the literature says, oh, you can't see vertical root fractures in CT scans. But if you get the right parameters, we're starting to see them. So um, we're seeing microstructures that change around them too. OK, getting back to um, how you detect these fractures, um, a lot of times, again, you can stain the area, remove the restoration for sure, but the tra transilluminator is what's showing in this picture, and it's uh, perpendicular to the crack. So if there's a complete crack in that tooth, there's an air space between the two pieces, and the light cannot go through. So we can tell what that fracture looks like. If you have a crazed line, which is not a complete crack, it's very incomplete on the surface of the enamel, the light shines right through. So um, this is a really helpful tool. Uh, again, we might need surgical uh, exploration for a vertical root fracture to prove that it is fractured. However, um, if you have bilateral probing defects, like on a mesial uh, root of a lower molar and a J-shaped lesion, you can already bet okay, that it's a vertical root fracture. So uh, along with the CT scan, we don't need to do a surgical exploration really anymore. Um, if you see a crack, you can try to wedge it a little bit with a, a spoon or an explorer or something to see if there's movable segments. So the five cracks, this is crazed lines, and you can see there's um, little marks throughout the uh, crown of the tooth. Uh, everybody's got these, okay? And sometimes on your front uh, central incisors or something, there's a line going up the middle. If it doesn't look good, then some people want treatment, but you don't need any treatment for this. Um, there's no pain, it's only in the enamel, it doesn't block any light, and uh, there's a good prognosis for this fracture, so don't worry about those. A fractured cusp, um, it's uh, located in the crown, of course, it could be mesial, distal, or facial lingual, and it includes part of the occlusal. There's some symptoms present, because when they bite down on this, it's in the attachment apparatus, and that hurts. So it does move a little bit, and it can be painful. Um, you can assess this with a bite test or the transilluminator or staining, and uh, you just remove the segment and restore it, and the prognosis is good. So these first two cracks are pretty straightforward. 